Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Brian Broom, and today we're talking about Samson, the extremely conflicted individual who mm-hmm. God used to deliver Israel, which was an extremely conflicted nation at the time. Right, Greg? Yeah. Um, let, 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 let me read something I wrote along these lines and see how this stands. Imagine two Hebrews, two men of Judah, meeting at a well or something and looking out over the hills and saying something like this. So, we have 3,000 men. Yeah. And our only objective is to capture and restrain one man. Yep. Mm. And how many men does the enemy have? The last testament was 1,000 on the next hill. So, we take our resistance leader <clears throat> with our 3,000 and hand him over to the enemy's 1,000. Is that right? That's right. Hmm. And you don't suppose anyone has thought about uh, taking on the enemy directly since we do outnumber them three to one? No. No, of course not. Are you crazy? That would, yeah, no, one, I, no I agree. I, I'm going to get dragged into battle. I mean, well, of course not. No one does. Right. So we grab Samson, turn him over to the Philistines, and graciously bow out. That's the plan. It's a right deal for Samson, of course, but he wouldn't, we wouldn't be here if he hadn't stirred up so much trouble. Right, right. You, you think the Lord's Messiah would get the whole go along to get along thing? You'd think. Something tells me that <laughs> go along to get along is not the chosen path of the <laughs> Lord's Messiah. <laughs> You know, sometimes we have trouble understanding the Messiah. Mm-hmm. We have our preconceived notions of how this whole thing's going to work. And um, sometimes setting the status quo, well, think of think of Egypt and Israel and Moses. The Why? status was not quo. <laughs> Why have you brought us out into the wilderness to kill us with hunger? We were better if we had abided still in Egypt. Or, (laughs) and when Jesus comes along in our lives, but yeah, I know I I, I asked for God's help, but I didn't know it would be so inconvenient and demand so much of me and I'd lose friends and my job might be on the line. And I mean, I just wanted a little bit of help. Hmm. God is not at our beck and call. God is not our our psychologist, our uh, mechanic, our handyman, our uh, woman who comes in once a week to help with the chores. <laughs> he comes as God and King. And that was something Israel in these days was having a hard time with. We're, we're back about the same time as Jephthah. So we're nearing the end of the 300-year cycle of Judges. Jephthah's doing his thing up north. And while we read about Jephthah, we don't hear much about Judah and the southern part because they had their own issues. And their issues were this tribe called the Philistines, tribe descended from the Egyptians. The Philistines gave their name to the land, Palestine. They weren't exactly Canaanites, so they didn't fall under the ban that the Canaanites did, but they were definitely enemies. And they they'd spent a good deal of time harassing and eventually oppressing Isn't Israel. Isn't there a link to Egypt? Yeah, well? they're, yeah, they were descended from, from Egyptians. And that's something to keep in mind as we continue on in Judges and then on into Samuel. But when we see Philistines, we should think Egyptian outpost. So we're sort of fighting that whole battle over again. The thing is that at this point, the Philistines seem to have been a kinder, gentler form of Egyptian. They weren't as they weren't as uh, oppressive as the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Canaanites. I mean, you know, so they disarmed you completely, and so they no doubt demanded heavy taxes, but they didn't come in and take all your food, and they didn't. Uh, Beat you up on the roadway, apparently normal. They let you, they let you have a militia, just couldn't exactly be armed, you know. And and after a while, it just seems like this is the way things have always gone when they've been going this way for forty years. <clears throat> so for forty years, Israel gets used to this, and uh, or Judah does. Let's see, forty years ago was what nineteen eighty one. Yeah. 
Yeah. You can't just I mean, say like, like I think that. about some of the government bureaucracies that were put in place in the 70s or 80s, yeah. and no one can imagine life without them anymore. Mm-hmm. Like the Department of Education, that was only, what, 1973 or something? I, I was talking to my kids at school when I was their age in high school. The whole homosexual agenda was like a fantasy fantasy page out of some obscure newspaper that no one read. No one talked about that. I mean, people knew homosexuality was a thing, and there were one or two late night shows that I remember the first one that actually had a homosexual character for the first time on TV late at night. But that was that was it. That was the presence of the thing. It just wasn't, and it was still something people made jokes about and. Mm. Didn't take too seriously because yeah, they're they're weird, and Christians would say, and that's really you know a bad sin. But it's so marginal, so fringe. Why why are you even worrying about this? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said in 1981. That was my first year of teaching. Here I graduated, and here I started teaching. So, 40 years is a long time. It was a long time for Israel to be in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. And it was a long time before, between Christ's ascension and the destruction of Jerusalem. It's a long time that David reigned. We see mm-hmm. 40 show up a lot and 40 year periods show up a lot. They're usually times of testing uh, when God is preparing his people to take dominion back. And as we look at this 40 year period, it doesn't look like it's working. <laughs> and so God intervenes miraculously. And it wasn't particularly my purpose to talk about. Samson's uh, miraculous birth, but his mother has a barren womb and an angel appears and announces all of this and puts Samson from the womb under the Nazarite vow, which means he's going to be a holy warrior before God. And the angel says he's going to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. So we could talk, if anyone wants to, we can, we could talk about that incident. We could talk about what a Nazarite is and does. Probably the one thing for our story, though, is, as most of us know, Nazarites were not to cut their hair until they were done. And then they would cut their hair and they would offer that hair to God. All the hair that grew during their work and service, they turned back to God to glorify him. Uh, Samson, however, Someone once asked my brother who had long hair in high school if he had taken a Walterite vow. <laughs> his name is Walter. And he said... <laughs> I don't. I don't know how you respond to that. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't think he knew how to respond to that. <laughs> I see what yeah. you did there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in my generation, a lot of young men who this is when growing your hair long was just becoming a thing. Well, Samson had long hair. <laughs> he also uh, didn't eat raisins. <laughs> yeah. Or grapes or wine. These were things that went with a vow because you're setting aside the blessings of the covenant to dedicate yourself to some form of warfare. It may be spiritual and doctrinal, maybe preaching. John the Baptist comes to mind. Or it may be on the battlefield, as it was with Samson. But anyway, he's from the tribe of Dan, and he, from a very early age, begins to get involved in all this. The, um, the spirit, we're told, the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. So this is, he's the Lord's Messiah. He's a judge. He's appointed by the angel of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is on him. So all of this, this is really good. And, and But it shifts immediately because remember, there's no chapter breaks in the original. It goes from the Spirit of God moving him to, and Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he goes back and, and asks for his father to arrange a marriage. It, it is easy to look at this and say, but wait, she's a pagan. We're never supposed to be burying pagans. He's obviously out of line and he has problems with his eyes and with girls all the way through. And that's true to a point. But, but you could but, marry a pagan if they became not a pagan. If they became not a pagan, we can think of us and Ruth or Rahab's husband, whose name escapes me at the moment. Mm-hmm. So it was it was not an impossibility. And, and that seems here to be the, the question. The Lord's Messiah is turning to a Gentile potential bride and saying, will you marry me and stand by me and be my partner and trust me to protect you from your own people? God and Samson both are looking for opportunities. And, and here's our phrase for tonight, to push the antithesis. 
Antithesis is that uh, rather multisyllabic word that can be <laughs> Easily rather sound. multisyllabic. <laughs> are there qu- are there quantities of monosyllabism? Uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, well, multisyllabism. Anti disestablishmentarianism. Pro anti disestablishmentarianism. <laughs> um, you know, it's antithesis. Yes, that was the yes. word. Mm-hmm. And spell for those of you who do not recognize the word, it's spelled like anti antithesis. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a word. That Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch theologian, philosopher, educator, prime minister, journalist, yada yada, made, all around cool dude, yeah, made popular and has it's, it's traditionally been popular since the late 1800s in Reformed theology. It means that from the time that God said, "I'm putting enmity between you and the woman," there has in fact been enmity, warfare between Satan and all that the promised seed stands for. And it's not just a theological battle, it is a cultural battle, it's a religious battle, it's a battle of civilization, thought forms, and everything else. And in every place, the world is at odds and at war with Jesus. And the temptation is for us always to soften that antithesis, to say, well, I'm a, I'm a, a, a real Christian, but I don't see why I can't do this because, well, everyone's doing it. and. The Bible doesn't actually speak about this at all. Yeah, it actually does. Now, whether or not it says anything relevant to your concerns is another question, of course. But uh, since Christ is, again, as Kuiper would say, there's not a square inch in all of time and space of which Jesus does not say, it's mine. We are called as Christians to discern his claims on everything. Some things are easy. Sexuality. He invented this thing called marriage, and he set its parameters, and it's between one man and one woman. It's supposed to be for life, and there are job descriptions that go with it, and we don't get to reinvent it or manufacture marriage 1.2 or whatever. <laughs> um, we, we take it as this, and so on throughout life. There are many things where God has set uh, specific boundaries in his word. And there are other things where the thing itself is sort of up for grabs, but the question is, how will you do it? Will you do it in faith to God's glory, obeying all of his laws? You can make a movie. Movie Movies are a potential in the creation. What are you going to do with them? Are you going to recognize that we are not to either practice, condone, or promote things like blasphemy, murder, adultery, false witness? Or are we going to say, but it's a movie, it doesn't matter. Here's an area of common ground where, you know, Jesus can kind of step aside and back off because this is just a cultural thing and the gospel doesn't speak to it. It's kind uh, of a low view of art, isn't it? It, it is. It's a low view of whatever you're talking about at the time. And that's but it, pres- like it, it seems to elevate art as like, oh, but we can all agree about this. This yes. is an important thing. But then it's like... Wait, but it's so unimportant that Jesus doesn't care what you put in it? <laughs> yeah. hmm. What are you going to do with Continue. this thing? Uh, and you speak of common, common ground and neutral things that we exalt. Mathematics, think of the Enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Uh, physics. We keep trying, the world keeps trying to find things and telling us, this is neutral ground. This is neither black or white. Christians and non-Christians can both work here. And there's a, there's a sense in which that's true in that it is objectively God's world because God objectively made it and it objectively honors and glorifies him and is upheld by his providence moment by moment and therefore is objectively and subjectively subject to his word. So, given that, <laughs> yeah, welcome to our father's world and territory. Now, you want to help, but understand that in your unbelief, it, that is going to be a little problematic. Oh, you want me to come over and serve your idol? Yeah, that's going to be more than problematic. So now let's decide who the producer of this film really is. So these are the kind of things. It can be in very personal and private matters of the heart. It can be even very public cultural matters. And we're going to, as we see, as we wander through this, we're going to see that this, this seems to be something that Judah was facing at the time. Yeah, well, you know, the Philistines really shouldn't be in control, but it's not that bad. And it's not like they're really hurting us and we can still worship and serve God. And 
I'm sure God will deal with it someday, somehow, some way. But let's not stir up trouble. Let's not point out that the Philistines are uh, wicked, idolatrous, and enemies of God, because that's not polite. There are a lot of them are really nice people. And Samson gets thrown into the mix to stir up trouble. We are told that with regard to this whole um, asking for a Gentile wife, that he, well, let me, but his father and mother, Samson's father and mother, knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. The question is, who's he? The immediate mm -hmm. antecedent would be the Lord, and that's probably what it means. But it could conceivably mean that this was self-conscious on Samson's part. Whether God pushed Samson into this and whether or not Samson understood it or not, the fact is that God was stirring up the antithesis. God was, was saying, um, you're way too comfortable here. You're way too comfortable, compromised under an oppressive Gentile power, where you're not living out your faith consistently the way I want you to. So let's bring everybody together, put them in the same room, the same bedroom, and see how kind and nice and sweet and gentle these people really are. Mm. Well, it never gets as far as the bedroom. <laughs> Samson goes down, you know the story, a lion comes up and roars at him, and he, the Spirit of God comes upon him, and he tears the lion in half. <laughs> and no, he does not have big bulging muscles, despite all the Sunday school pictures. Oh. Because later on, the Philistines will look at the guy and say, where's this power coming from? It's kind of... Mm. So this is confusing to me, because as soon as he tears apart the lion, the lion is a dead body. Yeah. Which he's not supposed to be touching. Right. See, here's the thing. And this, this comes up again later on with the uh, jawbone of an ass. Mm -hmm. a well... Nazarites could fight in battles. And if the first blush, that's, wait, does that mean they can only, oh. bru they can only bruise people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Non-lethal weapons. <laughs> Non-lethal weapons, no. Um, the the uh, lesser known sequel to the 80s classic. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently, they were allowed to fight in battle. But when the battle was over, they had to disassociate themselves from death rather quickly. Thus, Samson later on, in the middle of a battle, picks up a bone, which is unclean. Mm -hmm. It's a jawbone of an ass. It's really unclean. And uses his weapon, but as soon as the battle's over, he tosses it far away from himself. So the issue is not that as such. But he leaves the lion's carcass, and when he comes back, he finds that some bees have created a honeycomb in it, and there's honey. And he uses a stick to, to poke into it and bring out some honey, he shares it with his parents. And so now the next question, is this compromise? It's touching a dead body, but he didn't touch the dead body. How close is too close? How critical are we supposed to be? Do we want other people to be as critical of us as we are as of Samson? <laughs> Let's be That's careful. That's the here. question. Yeah. <laughs> That's easy to be careful of Samson. He's been dead for thousands of years. Yeah, well, someday you're going to look him in the eye in heaven and say, yeah, I thought you were such a jerk, but yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Wow, you're not mean. I thought you were. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's interesting that, that God does not really comment on it. He just tells us that it happens. But he, the parents make, arrange the marriage and, and, and they, they're, is there not a good Jewish girl that Roger could marry? No, I, I like her and he's the Lord's Messiah. So cutting him some slack, we can say, well, maybe this, maybe he does understand what God's doing. God's going to stir up some trouble. So they have a big or party. Or are his parents being pushovers? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Oh, okay. No, I'm, say, I'm saying, <laughs> that's my question. I mean, that's a, that's a real question. I mean, we would like all of this to be black and white. Mm -hmm. The only thing we know that going into it, we are told the Spirit of God is upon him and moves him regularly. And it will not be, and, and, and during this whole thing, the Spirit of God comes upon him very powerfully on a couple of occasions. So, is this does mean that he is cutting corners, but God does not abandon him? That's good news for us. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that sometimes serving God uh, what may look like cutting corners to other people is, in fact, the very thing we should be doing. And we've seen a good sample of that in Judges, and we'll see it in the life of Samuel and David as well, and even, like, even in the life of our Lord. You could have healed them on on um, Friday <laughs> or Sunday. Why'd you have to do it on Saturday, the Sabbath, and stir up all that trouble? Point. Yeah, <laughs> making a point. Anyhow, so the girl's father throws a big party, 
and drafts 30 young men to act as his ushers, groomsmen, whatever, because he has no friends in Philistine land. And he comes up with a riddle, which was a thing in those days. Something about Samson, he's always kind of funny, funny, peculiar, not funny. Well, kind of funny, haha, too. And so here's he he challenged them. Um, if you, the the feast lasts for a week, wedding feasts often did. So if you can answer the riddle before the feast runs out, then I will give you thirty changes of clothes. But if you can't get it, you give them to me. The odds favor them because each one of them will lose at most a the price of a single change of, of clothes. He's going to have to come up with thirty if he loses. Well, right away, they go after the girl and begin asking the girl, well, what's this riddle? Because the riddle is this. Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. I am not sure that is a lawful riddle. I am reminded. Right? It's like, what's in my pocket? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I'm reminded very much of The Hobbit and, and all of that. And yeah. it's... Is it clever in Hebrew? <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> the thing is, it's because it is the Messiah who speaks, its answer must be spot, sought after the Spirit. If you just try to list down all the things that there are, you're going to miss it. Out of the eater came forth. Now, we assume parallelism because that was that's the one clue. Mm -hmm. So, presumably, the... Sorry, just the eater lost it was again. strong and the meat was sweet. Yeah. The, the eater is strong and the meat, the food is sweet. Now, had they noticed or heard or looked around their borders, they would have found this dead lion torn into. Certainly, as you've said before, random lions were a thing. <laughs> so, they might get that and, and, and sweet. The, the, but the, the question, in, if you're thinking spiritually rather than what's the clever twist, it, it's not as difficult as it might seem. What is, you know, we use, we still have the problem, strong as a lion. Mm -hmm. um, what actually is stronger than a lion? Well, the Lord's Messiah, and he just proved it. What mm -hmm. is sweeter than honey? The psalmist will tell us the law of God is sweeter than the honeycomb. Mm -hmm. Spiritual discernment would have gotten them there, but without that, there it just it just sounds like blah 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 blah. And so they go after the girl and try to get her to reveal it, but she doesn't know the answer, and she begins leaning upon Samson, trying to get him to tell her, and he puts her off. I haven't told my parents. I'm going to tell you, which does not sound very husbandly somehow. No. <laughs> um, but it goes on. In the last day, the the, the groomsmen come back and really lean on the one, basically say, we're going to burn down your father's house if you don't find this because we can't afford this. And so she leans heavily on Samson. Oh, does but hate me and loveth me not. Now it's put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and has not told it of me. And it says, she came to pass on the seventh day that he told her because she lay sore upon him. And she tells the Philistines, and they come back and say, what is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he responds, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you had not found out my riddle. Oof. Flattery. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So. All the ladies love to be called heifers. That's what I'm Yes. Told. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cows. But just so when you think, okay, we're bottoming out here, the spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And he goes down to a nearby city of Ascalon, a Philistine city, kills 30 men, takes their stuff, and hands it over to um, these groomsmen in payment of the debt. The logic here is, is pretty good for a judge, eye for an eye. Um, they won the riddle by information that wasn't theirs, so I will pay my debt with clothes that aren't mine. <laughs> But he killed people. It's war. He's the Messiah. But he's so upset about this that he he just walks off and leaves the girl, which is a mistake. Because the Philistines come back. Well, actually, um, he comes back after a while and finds out that the girl's father has given her to somebody else. So is this like, were they officially married? Is this abandonment? What's 
what's going on? Uh, yeah, it's it's it seems ambiguous. The father protests. I verily thought that you utterly hated her, and I gave her to your companion. But he came back assuming that they were married, and that what needed to happen was consummation. So Samson's mm. looking upon it as an unconsummated betrothal, and the father is looking on it as abandonment. Samson does not blame the father. But he does blame the Philistines for creating this mess. And in his mind, they have deprived him of um, children, of seed. Mm -hmm. So again, with an eye for an eye mentality, if they're going to take away my seed. <laughs> He's going to go burn a field down. <laughs> it's going to burn down their seed. And and so in, in the traditional Samson-esque way, he goes out and captures uh, 300 foxes or jackals. How do you that catch in itself? <laughs> it's just like it's just like brushed sides. Like, oh, he went out and did that, and then da 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 da. -da. Yeah. <laughs> so somehow he went and got foxes, and I'm reminded of Solomon's warning of the little foxes that spoil the vines, with <laughs> regard to the things that can mess up a marriage. Well, they'd messed up his marriage. <laughs> but a sea. sleeping fox catches no poultry. <laughs> It is shady. It is shady. Um, <laughs> it uh, And he takes them and he turns them tail to tail. So he ties their tails up apparently and sticks a firebrand in between said tails and then lights the firebrand. I guess he's, he must have them like in a bag or a pin or something. And two by two, he pulls them out, ties up the tail, sticks the firebrand, lights the firebrand, and then throws them out into the standing corn. <laughs> And they, of course, are terrified to have fire at their rear. So they're trying to pull in opposite directions at the same time. And so they're just going crazy through all. I mean, the SPCA should be after Samson for this. This is uh, actually the, the <clears throat> first historical instance of, a, of the usage of a Beyblade. What is that? <laughs> that we'll explain was that later. A children's toy from what, the 90s? Something like that. I uh -huh. <laughs> lost. Okay, you can explain later. Um, and so it, 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 the field gets burned down. <clears throat> the Philistines ask, why, who did this? Samson. Why? Because the girl's father gave the girl to somebody else. So obviously it's the father's fault and the girl's fault. So they go burn them down, burn down their house and kill them. Samson's response is, um, though you have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. So now it's open warfare. Uh, this is chapter 15 of Judges, verse 8. He smote them hip and thigh. The metaphor seems to mean with great confusion. Like, you know, we, we use the phrase head over heels, mm -hmm. which is weird because actually your heels are over your head. But it's that kind – think about it. But it's that what? kind of – but your head is over your heels on a yeah, normal day. Yeah, but when day. you yes, on a normal day, and so when you yeah. said I went head over heels, it means that's, heels that's over no head. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, so there's this great slaughter, and he goes up and escapes to uh, some kind of um, outjetting rock. And the Philistines go, and 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 this is in in the territory of Judah. So they've in, they've invaded with armed force now which apparently is not what they normally have been doing. They've kind of left Jude alone, but now Samson stirred up trouble. They're bringing their armies in. And apparently they're bringing in about a thousand men. And they send word to Judah that says, um, bring Samson to us. So Judah calls together its militia, probably unarmed, because later we find out that Judah, that Sam, uh, pfft, the Philistines have made a big deal about disarming Israel. But, you know, you have rocks and clubs and things and sticks. So we got 3,000 men of Judah coming up to Samson, and this is what they say. Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done to us? Um, I'm the resistance leader. I'm the war leader. I'm the judge. I'm the Messiah. It's kind of my job description to stir up trouble and get these guys out of here. No, Wait, no, no. So but, you're telling me uh, that you're loyal to God's enemies. No. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, I'm not loyal. I mean, it's but just, you know, this is the you're way ruler, thing. You're ruler, you're just... Yeah, they're the rulers them. and we shouldn't mess yeah. with the rulers. We should just submit and, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, God will take care of it someday by sending us 
Well, a you messiah? know, Messiah. <laughs> well, you know, somebody somehow. I mean, he'll he'll wipe them out when it's his time. But in the meantime, you can't be stirring up trouble, pal. I mean, we appreciate your good intentions, but this is just so out of line. Um, he, Samson's response is simply, as they did to me, so I've done to them. So in Samson's mind, he's still acting the judge, eye for eye. They took away my seat. I took away theirs. Uh, my wife, they valued at 30 changes of silver. That's... They took her away. So five of clothes. Yeah. So yes. Sorry, clothes. So uh, you know, fivefold restitution. So one hundred and fifty. I uh, came up with one hundred and fifty pairs of foxes mm-hmm. to take away their seed. See, it works neat that way. Kind of get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's way out there. But um, yeah, we can't do this. This doesn't work. There are rulers over this. We have come down to bind thee that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. <laughs> it's nice of them to announce their, their intentions. <laughs> okay, c- come put your hands right here. We're going to tie you up. Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not fall into me yourselves. And they speak to them, uh, no, 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 no. No, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. We'll just bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hands, but surely we will not kill thee. We're just going to tie you up so you can't possibly escape and hand them hand you over to your mortal enemies. But we won't kill you ourselves. We'll let them do it. This sounds very familiar. <laughs> hmm. And uh, he says, all right. And they bind him. And as he's brought to them, the Philistines shout against him, sort of the way the lion had roared against him earlier. <laughs> And uh, and by the way, think of a lion on the border of Egypt. There's mm-hmm. one made of stone. And uh, the Spirit of God comes on him again, comes mightily upon him. The cords that were upon his arms become as flax that are burnt with fire. Just bleep, and they're gone. And he found a new jawbone of an ass. Well, as what it's doing? To an old jawbone of an ass. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, yes. as in one that is not uh, clean <laughs> from things picking it. Cl- Picking it yeah, it maybe, it's maybe has goop hanging from it or something. Uh, little bugs crawling in it. You know. Anyway, it's gross. And he puts it forth, puts forth his hand and takes it, uses it as a, as a weapon. He took it and slew a thousand men therewith. And as he does, he makes a little poem. In the King James, it reads, With the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, I've slain a thousand men. One commentator, trying to get at the poetry of the thing, said with the Jaw of an ass, I've piled them in mass. Um, <laughs> another says, with the jawbone of an ass, one ass, two ass, three ass, I've slain a thousand, four ass, five ass, thousand men. Uh, anyway, so he's doing his little. One fish, so, two fish, red fish, blue fish. I was going for Muhammad Ali. Oh. Do you remember him? I, yeah. I I know the you, name. You know the name. Okay. Well, probably a lot of our listeners don't. Um, world weight boxing or heavyweight boxing champion of the United States and I assume the world. Um, <laughs> he had a reputation for making little Dr. Seuss worthy poems hmm. to put his enemies off balance as he went into the ring. And unfortunately, I don't have any of them memorized. I'm sure is someone that, out there could Is he the float like a butterfly sting that's, like a bee? That's gotcha. the guy. Yeah. Oh. Samson's kind of like that 2,000 years earlier, 2,500 years earlier or so. 3,000 years earlier. I don't know. Came to pass that he'd made an end of speaking. He cast away the jawbone out of his hand. So he gets rid of it. And then God miraculously provides water in that place. And he judges Israel 20 years. So he started this process. He's begun to stir things up. He offered this Gentile girl the privilege of being Messiah's bride, but rather than run to him and trusting him for her, his protection, she ran to her people and the result has been bloody and violent. And it's made it, Judah very uncomfortable because now they, although Samson didn't die, they are the ones who put him in the hands of the enemy. Mm. So it's, you know, and Samson continues doing something for a long time, 20 years, not the full 40 but 20 years. And at the end of that time, Samson does have a less problem. He goes down to a a Philistine city to Gaza and we think, okay, so he's going to go down there and start some trouble. 
But he gets sidetracked. He sees a prostitute and goes and procures her services. And there's no way to explain or excuse that one. And it kind of seems like it comes out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, well, after 20 years. And, and there's a warning there, I think, that it is possible to walk with God faithfully for a very long time. And if you let your guard down and trust your track record, you can fall pretty badly and you can take a lot of people with you when you fall. Um, my eldest daughter was just discovered um, uh, Jimmy Swaggart's record. Um, while she was looking up a particular song, apparently he was associated with, and then I picked, I pointed out um, how Jimmy Swagger got into this. There was this guy named Jim Baker, who himself had a TV ministry called PTL, who got into trouble because of his affair with the church secretary. You know, these were men the world thought were very holy. They were TV evangelists, and they spoke out. Against sin, they spoke out against Reformed theology too, but you know, and they fell badly. You can't, we can never get to the point where we can assume, I've walked with God for 20 years. Yeah, well, Samson did too. It's no guarantee there. But while he's doing this, the people, the men of Gaza, of Gaza say, ah, he's there. When he comes out, let's get him. Uh, assuming he's going to be there till the morning because nobody travels at night. The gates are shut. So he's going to wait till morning. When he comes out, we'll, we'll get him. Well, he gets up in the middle of the night and goes and takes the gate of the city, its doors, its post, and carries them away and puts them on a nearby hill before Hebron. Now, this is not to excuse his sin at all, but it is to point out something. He, the Lord's Messiah had the power to tear down the gates of the enemy cities, mm -hmm. at which point one might hope the Jewish militia would run in and take the city because its defenses just went away and are sitting over there on another hill someplace. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't. Here's your opportunity. Anyone? Anyone? No, apparently not. And then, of course, we come to the story that everyone knows is affair with Delilah, who may or may not have been a Philistine. We don't know her background, but she had contacts with the Philistines. And the Philistines, being the uh, like the rest of the pagan world, are very lost in, in a magical worldview. They assume that this is magic. So he's got some magic secret. Find out what it is. Tell us. We'll do the counter magic, and then we get rid of him. We go back to life as normal. And Delilah... Um, Flirts with him, seduces him, tries to get him to give up his secret and ask a number of times what's going on here. And he plays, rather than realizing, why are you asking this? Okay, for one, you are obviously not a believer, whether you're a stranger or a proselyte or a stranger in the land or whatever you are. He's lived with her long enough or had an affair with her long enough to know you're not a godly lady. And suddenly you're all interested in why my why I have this great strength. Um, he's probably talked to her at least a little bit about his God. It would come up in normal conversation. You're living in Israel, and but rather than say I had something suspicious here, and this is not something we can talk about. If we're going to be friends, you need to you need to drop this. Or how about better, I just leave because I'm obviously living a compromised life because this is this is. But every time he makes a suggestion, she follows it binds him, binds his hair, whatever. And every time as, she, as he falls asleep beside her on her knees, once he's done the binding, she yells out, the Philistines are up on thee. And the truth is that there happen to actually be real Philistines nearby, but he never sees them because he wakes up and immediately breaks out of whatever trap she set. And this keeps happening. How many times does this have to happen before you realize your girlfriend's up to no good? Mm -hmm. Every time you tell her, here is a trap that will destroy me. She sets it and then pretends that she's springing it and then just kind of laughs it off. What is this this pattern of giving away his secret to women who totally betray him with it? Like, <laughs> well, you'd think he'd have learned about this 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, good know? point. I, had, I actually had not made that connection. Shame on me. That's an excellent question. Yeah, he didn't learn. He didn't learn 20 years ago. He hasn't learned now. Um, so finally, she cries and weeps. And this is the same thing. And says, you, you don't love me because you won't tell me the truth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him. So the soul was vexed unto death. Why is he still there? Right. It's like, like. There's a moment where it's like, okay, so this could be like this little teasing, haha, running joke yeah. between the two of them. But then, no, he actually hates it. <laughs> why yeah. is he putting up with this? Yeah, why is he just saying, <laughs> look, we're staying, even, even in a compromised situation, most men will say, this is annoying. Stop it. Mm -hmm. But he's, he's so besotted with her, he can't even gather the strength to do that. This man who in the spirit is so strong and powerful doesn't have the moral strength to say, shut up, dear, let alone the strength to walk away from her. And so in the end, he gives in. He tells her sort of the secret because even his own interpretation is twisted. He told her all his heart and said to her, there hath not come a razor upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me and I shall be weak and shall be like any other man. Her questions have always presupposed some sort of magical approach to the universe and he's humored her. But now when the question is, where does your strength come from? He does not say, I was, my birth was ordained by God himself I was made a Nazarite from the womb and given this job, and it is the Spirit of God who is my strength. He goes right for the hair. As if the hair, and, and I don't know how many children and, and unlearned Christians and non Christians, if you ask them, would not in fact say, Oh, yeah, he got his strength from his hair. No, he didn't. He got it from the Spirit of God. If someone had snuck up behind him in his sleep and shaved him, it would not have changed the spirit's presence. He's walking by faith, or he has been. But even here, his own thinking is confused. He's treating it like his gift, like it's magic. He's beginning to think like the Philistines. Well, we all know the story. She calls in a barber, and, and while Samson's sleeping on her lap, the barber shaves his head. and. And God, because he has broken his vow deliberately by betraying it, uh, withdraws his presence. He knew not that the Spirit of God had departed from him. Philistines take him, put out his eyes, bring him down to Gaza, bind him with fetters of brass, and they make him grind. He turns a grinding stone in a prison house. And there's a bit of irony here, kind of the eye for the eye thing, because Grinding mm -hmm. is a figure of adultery in the book of Job. There's also the seed involved. And the seed There's involved. There's also, that's normally what you would have an ass doing, right? Right, and an ass, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's all come back. Um, the strength of the lion is <laughs> put in the place of an ass. <laughs> yeah, because of his compromise. We're told, how be it the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. And again, it's easy to take that and say, oh, look, the magic power is coming back. Uh, we took the kryptonite away, right away, kept kryptonite away, and so Superman's powers are returning. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that God's mercies are new every morning. God makes hair grow. Samson didn't make it grow. Mm -hmm. And there's no telling what would have happened if they had gone out on a regular basis and shaved. Given their magical worldview, they should have. If <laughs> yeah. they really believed this was the source, they were incredibly stupid. Or maybe she never told them. She just, you know, he's weak now. Go for him. Does he look funny to you somehow? Yeah, that doesn't look like the one in posters at all. I'm not sure. No, let's get him. And... Um, they have a big celebration in the Temple of Dagon, who was a fish god, <laughs> merman. Uh, and they say, our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, to his hands. And they praise their god. Our god has delivered into our hands the, our enemy, the destroyer of our country that slew many of us. And while this is going on and they're bringing him out and making sport for him, he gets a breather apparently. 
And uh, they set him between the, some of the pillars. And Samson says to the little boy whose job it is to lead him around, well, permit me to feel the pillars where the house stands. And he's allowed to do this because for some old people are drunk and laughing and not paying attention. The house was full of men and women. And all lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport, men and women. And Samson called unto the Lord. <clears throat> now his hair is regrown, but that didn't bring back his strength. He said, O Lord, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the enemies for my two eyes. And so, two eyes, two pillars. Pillars hold up everything. Eyes are organs of dominion. And there's probably more to it than that, but that's what comes to me quickly. And so he pushes on the pillars, he says the support pillars, and the whole upper roof where everybody is comes tumbling down. And as Samson does it, he says, let me die with the Philistines. He bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were therein, so that the dead which he slew in his death were more than they which he slew in his life. And his family comes and buries him. He judged Israel 20 years. Uh, and often, I know my students and, and older folk too will ask, was this suicide? Uh, was he out of God's will here? Well, no, he's a soldier on a battlefield. But it didn't have to end like this. Had he been faithful, had he guarded his heart in what might seem a comparatively little thing, but it was a big thing to Samson, he could have eventually led Israel on the battlefield and he could have killed tens of thousands of the enemy or routed them out of Judah altogether. It was a great victory. He crushed them under the stone. He crushed their heads under the stones, very much a messianic image. But he could have done more. God used him for this, and God accomplished what God wanted. He had said, You'll begin to deliver Israel. And now, with um, Samson dead, Samuel and Saul and David will take up the task. And after David's time, the Philistines pretty much aren't a threat anymore. Uh, but it takes a little while. So there we have it. We have this. This man and, and the writer of Hebrews lists him among the heroes of faith. His faith was real. When he died, he went to glory. And yet there is there's this he, some people have said that Saul comes closest to being a tragedy among the characters of scripture. I wonder if maybe Samson isn't. Because there's a victory here, but at what cost? And it was so so the cost was so unnecessary. Because what started this was first his fall to the prostitute, to his own lust, and then to Delilah, his own lusts. He never got that under control. And it, it, I'm, I'm thinking now of David. You know, David had much the same problem. Mm -hmm. And David's solution was multiply wives, which is a semi-legal way of... Uh, satiating your less, perhaps. In some ways, the difference is not that great. And yet, Samson does not recover. And Samson is very much alone. He doesn't really have friends. He doesn't have a support network, as David did. He doesn't have prophets put, pointing their bony fingers in his face, saying, thou art the man. Uh, and, and there are dangers with playing the Lone Ranger. But there was no one else, because Judah itself was horribly compromised and was very content with what it had and where it was, and content to be under the heel of the Philistines. So nobody here is exactly pushing the antithesis. Samson did what he could for a while, and yet he failed in his personal life, and that cost a huge cultural victory, uh, cultural defeat, although with some cultural victory, military victory attached. So a sad story, a triumphant story, a mixed blessing. Um, it kind of yeah. drives home the point of all the judges and all the kings as well, that you have these people stepping in to fill the role, but all of them fall short. Mm -hmm. We need a better judge. We need a better king. Yeah. One of our elders years and years ago had been teaching through judges, uh, asked me, he didn't ask me much very often, but he asked me this. He said, um, you know, people have been coming up to me and saying, after every one of these judges, everything just falls apart. How do you square this with your post-millennialism? 
<laughs> and my answer was really simple. It's the answer you just gave. They weren't Jesus. They're, they're mere human sinners, and um, their life is riddled with compromise and failure. And yet God uses them. And um, we were um, in Bible study last night, we were going through Hebrews 11. And we saw God's verdict upon these people with all their flaws. God is well pleased in them. Something, a, a, a phrase he otherwise reserves for his son. Uh, they're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Yeah, they have their failings, and sometimes those failings have huge historical consequences. And yet God is pleased in them and pleased to call them his own. And there's great, great comfort for us in all that. At the same time, there's warning. Mm -hmm. um, here's the rest of that article I wrote. History's a battlefield. There's no neutral ground. We either follow the Lord's Messiah into battle or we war against him. There are no other options. Abraham Kuyper used the word antithesis to drive home the nature and extent of the spiritual and cultural war that is Earth's history. Christ claims all of human life and culture is his own, but at every point Satan would deny him his dominion. Jesus will win because in principle, and in fact, he's already won. But the implications of his victory still need to be worked out on Earth and in history. And so the battle continues and we must each choose our role. Uh, on the side, uh, as Calvinists sometimes, and I, I've seen this a lot, especially in young people who have not been trained well enough, but sometimes in older folk as well, we don't want to talk about choosing Jesus, mm -hmm. choosing the side. <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you have to choose. This, this, this is a choice. True, you'll make, unless until God regenerates you, you'll make the wrong choice. <laughs> But you most certainly must choose. You must make a decision. And, and God and, made you with a will. And yes. He, you engage it. Yes. Yes. He sets our hearts free so we can choose the right thing. Mm -hmm. And we must choose our role. There's nothing Arminian in that. We may play Philistines, nice enough in our own way, but enemies of Yahweh and his kingdom. We may play the role of Israel and Judah, claiming God's grace for eternity, but cowing before the enemy in the broader battlefield of society and culture, betraying Christ for peace in our time. We may imitate Samson and win a few stunning victories in the culture wars while we lose the war in our own hearts and our own families. As we've seen, this role is the most tragic. Or we can be men and women after God's own heart. Segue toward David. But first, we have the two stories at the end of Judges that we need to look at mm -hmm. that continue the rather depressing tone of the book and tell us why we keep going through some of the cycles. Yeah. Until God intervenes. Judges is odd because it keeps escalating to the very yeah. end. In so many biblical patterns, the high point is in the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this one never it never drops. It just keeps building and building and building. Yeah. And leads us right into Samuel, where a lot of the things that happened before we now see come out even more plainly. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk about that when the time comes. Yeah. But we have Ruth in the middle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which we'll be getting too soon. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, shall we wrap up for tonight with some recommendations? Yeah. Uh, courtesy of my wife and daughter, I have one. I kind of have to explain it, although you two will understand well enough. In our literature classes at school, we have something we call spots. Mm -hmm. it, it is not a contagious disease. <laughs> um <laughs> Oh, and I not? don't know. No. I don't know where the word originally comes from, uh, because it's one that my own teacher, Dr. Powell, used when I was in school. But a spot is simply this: it's a, it's a, a phrase, a maxim, a well-known quote from some piece of literature that we ask our students to memorize, along with the title and author, because they're the things that educated people once knew well. Now, ideally, what should happen is that we should read all of the books multiple times, <laughs> become very familiar with them, talk about them with everybody until these things just stick in our minds. You know, the way we watch movies. Mm -hmm. if, if I say, for instance, I understood that reference. <laughs> Captain it, America, <laughs> yeah, Avengers. Everyone, every, yeah, Captain America, Avengers 2012 or whatever it is. Um, yeah, we do that with, with uh, of all the gin joints in all the world. We, there are Casablanca, that, 1941. Yes. Right. We get those. Because we do that. We see movies over and over. We talk about them. People used to do that with books. And so this, this thing of memorizing little fragments of literature is, after a fashion, cheating. 
<laughs> and one young lady in college, when I explained to her, you know, I haven't actually read these books. I've just been taught about them. She said, oh, you're a charlatan. Oh, <laughs> that hurt. Um, I remember that story. <laughs> and there's some truth in it. I've tried to make up for that by reading a lot of the books since then, but I have not succeeded in all of them. But these things, a, a, another uh, writer, E.D. Hirsch, came up with a, a term he called cultural literacy. He even trademarked mm -hmm. it. Uh, and there's a dictionary of cultural literacy and a book that introduces the topic. And the idea is that once upon a time, and even today, there are things that all educated people do because they were educated. There wasn't a particular format for getting there. You read, you talked to smart people, to educated people, and these were just things you learned over and over again. And they form the backdrop of our language. They put flesh on the bones of our grammar. And so if I say Big Brother is watching or what, you want to live in utopia? <laughs> or, yeah, that looks like the grassy knoll. You know, people know what these things mean, at least, you know, the older generation would. And, and we, and in those little references, we can build implications and connections to say, oh, you're saying this is like this, but I know about this from the story and all of this goes with it. Something the Bible itself does with itself. Mm -hmm. If we see a, a lady with a barren womb, as we do often, or we see a young girl at a well waiting, you know, we, we, we begin to realize, oh, this is what's about to happen. So Light anyway, chief. yeah, yeah, well, we call them spots. So I am recommending the learning of spots. If you got nothing better to do, I mean, if you want, you can um, email us and we'll send yeah. you a list of some of our favorites. <laughs> but there are ways of finding these things. And I'm sure there's some brilliant way on the internet, some key phrase you could stick in, popular sayings in English language. Or you could go to Hirsch's cultural literacy and go through the dictionary. He actually does have a section of quotations that would be useful. Uh, this came to mind because today uh, my daughter and Mr. French were listening to uh, people who wanted to be in the music program. Mm. They got three. <laughs> That's not three enough. auditions or three? three auditions. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And so Mr. French was saying, do you think it would be okay to reopen auditions just for high school and junior high in hopes of getting a few more? Or would that look, you know, like favoritism or something? And my daughter, Emily, said, my grace to one <laughs> is wrong, is wrong to, to none. To none. <laughs> Mr. French smiled. So I just quoted that to somebody the other day. So... They are valuable ways of looking at life, summing up life, communicating. And in this context, I will, as a sub-recommendation, recommend the Star Trek episode. <laughs> Darmok and Chilad. <laughs> at Tanakra. Okay, so that's mine. I, I did make at least one friend in college by referring to that Star Trek episode. <laughs> <laughs> C.S. Lewis says, a friendship is born the moment someone says, you too? I thought I was the only one. Yes, exactly. Well, the thing is, so we, we talk about C.S. Lewis all the time, and we talk about the Space Trilogy all the time. So mm. I'm probably tripling yeah. down or quadrupling down on the recommendation of that hideous <laughs> strength. Uh, whenever we talk about antithesis, mm. I think about Cecil Dimple and his yes. comments on how over time the world seems to become sharper. All the shades of gray become... Yes not more defined as gray, but more defined as closer to black and white. And o mm -hmm. over time, mm. things becoming clearer mean more clearly opposed to their opposites. And I think we've seen that. Yes. We've seen that in this story, this, this account of Samson. We've seen it in the news lately. I've been following the Kyle Rittenhouse trial and it's it's just it rings truer every year. <laughs> so that hideous strength, C.S. Yeah. Lewis. I have several I could recommend, but the two books that I'm currently reading, I'm not far enough into to completely recommend, uh, except for one of them, which I I already know is going to be delightful, which is 
I'll just start with that one anyway. This is a half recommendation because <laughs> I'm only three chapters in. Uh, James Harriet's All Creatures Great and Small. Oh, oh yes, please. Yes. <laughs> Which is the most wholesomely written narration I've ever encountered. It is so quaint and British. I just, I want to read it forever. Uh, <laughs> yes. And so, like, I've you been... get to the end of it and you're like, oh, thank goodness, there are five more. <laughs> or that, that, is good. that is good news. Um, but, like, I've been reading it out loud uh, to my wife while she does like work on one of her puzzles or something because it helps her focus. And so I've been doing voices. And so the the opening <laughs> chapter has um, uh, an, a nosy uncle named um, – actually, I'm sorry. In, in the narration, he's just called Uncle. And so I've given him a, you know, a, a, a slightly uh, chubby-sounding uh, country English accent. <laughs> And he talks all about Mr. Broomfield, who's an excellent veter- veterinarian, don't you know? And um, all that. So that that's my first one. I, I am sure it's going to be delightful. It's just I can't say that it is based on what I've read of it. So I, like, I, I can't say that the, all I of it is. I can attest, 100%. Cool. So we have a, we have a cosign yeah. to that. The hey, other one... made it into a series, so, you know. Oh, that yeah, is what I've true. been told as well. Um, mm-hmm. My wife watched it a whole bunch growing up, I think. Yeah. Uh, the oh, second that was thing, the one with uh, the the actor who knows about woody, medieval weaponry. That yes. guy, yeah. Hardy. Yeah. Hardy. Yeah. Tom Hardy? Or is I this... remember I called him by the wrong name last time I mentioned him on the podcast. And <laughs> there's another actor whose last name is Hardy, so I'm not going to pretend I know his first name. I don't know either. <laughs> um, the second thing, which is my more full-throated um, recommendation, is th- there is a Japanese word called sundoku and it means i think it literally means like reading pile like in practical mm-hmm. usage but it, it commonly is used as the act of buying books and never reading them <laughs> i'm going to recommend you do the opposite of that which is to actually read the books that you own uh, which was a project i undertook starting in the summer of last year where i was like i have all these books i have, I have almost 300 books on my shelf and i have read 25% of them. I counted and did the math to figure out what percentage <laughs> I had read, and it was one out of four. Mm. Uh, so I started reading more of them, and it's like, oh, this has been sitting on my shelf for some of them as long as seven years. Um, and I finally read it in 2020 or 2021, and it was great, and I'm sad I didn't read it before mm. you know, this recent mm. timestamp. So that's my recommendation is to actually read books that you own. Mm-hmm. That's, that's good life advice. Okay. All right. Thank you guys both so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Um, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can visit our Facebook page. Give us a listen on your favorite podcast catcher on YouTube or on Rumble. Um, and if you'd like to support us financially, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. To our existing financial supporters, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thanks for listening. See you next time. <laughs>